Well, looks like the number of participants is leveling off, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Raymond with WCET. Thank you so much for joining us for our final post-conference session, which concludes the WCET annual meeting. So thank you so much for being part of it. We're looking forward to being virtual or being face-to-face -face next year, but for a virtual event, we've really enjoyed being able to connect on these different pre-conference pre and post-conference sessions. And then don't forget, you can always go back and view the sessions that you missed too, if you're a registrant. We'll have those available through the end of December. So thank you so much for joining this session. If this is your first session with us, just know that we have two chat options. One is on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize your question for our moderator, we like to use the Zoom Q&A feature in the blue bar, but we'll be looking for both chats and the Q&A to see if you have comments or questions, and we hope you do. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. We have a wonderful moderator today, my friend and colleague, Dr. Tanya Spillavoy, who's the Director of Open Policy for WCT. Welcome, Tanya. Thanks, Megan. I'm happy to be here and happy to welcome all of our guests today and everyone who's here to participate in our session. Today, we're going to be talking about open educational resources in states and systems in the United States. First, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Tanya Spillaboy, and I work with WCET. The program I lead is called the National Consortium for Open Educational Resources, or NCOER. We're focused mainly on large scale change in states and systems so that people are interested in adopting and um, utilizing open educational resources for equity for students. And so if you look at the map, you can see the, the main organizations that I work with. Uh, WICHE is the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. They're located in the Western states of the United States and they're uh, represented in red on the map. And WCET is part of WICHE. And then if you look in the Midwestern region, there's the Midwestern Higher Education Compact or MEC. And North Dakota and South Dakota are members of both MEC and WICHE, and they're in the center two states that are crosshatched orange. Um, the Southern Region Education Board is in the Southern half of the United States. It has a lot of states, which I suppose it wasn't necessarily half, but it seems like a lot of states for SREB. And then the New England Board of Higher Education is the, uh, the New England Board up in purple or lavender at the top of that map. And the work that we do spans every state and territory in the United States. Each of these different regional compacts are focused on a different aspect of OER and equity and implementation in their states and systems. We're all focused on equity, but WICHE is focusing primarily on minority serving institutions, collaboration among the states and rigorous research in those areas. MEC is focused on equity as well, with cost savings, dual enrollment, CTE, and technology. SREB is also focused on equity in dual enrollment, CTE, and has a primary focus on HBCUs and collaboration among K-12 and higher ed. Uh, NEBI is also focused on equity. You'll see like a, a theme here. Um, we're working on evidence-based teaching and learning practices through open pedagogy and other evidence-based practices for reparative justice and utilizing OER to do that. And WCET, where I'm located, is really focused on bringing all of these groups together, scaling open through all of the different states and, and systems. And today we'd like to talk about some of the real standout initiatives in states and uh, systems in the United States. So before we move on to our special guests, we really need to pause and make sure that we define OER for everyone. So according to the Hewlett Foundation, who has been working on open and supporting it since 2002, OER are freely licensed and remixable learning resources and generally 
That means that they have a Creative Commons license or an open license. It's the whole definition of OER is focused on licensing so that it's open. And that means that it can lower costs for students and that we can use it in our teaching and learning to engage students and really energize and empower teachers to have control over their lessons and really feel active in the, in the learning environment. So with that um, little intro, we'll move on to one of, the, one of the groups that I've had the privilege of working with. Um, I was the um, advisor for the inception of the Colorado OER Council. And I'm so excited to see the wonderful work that they've done in Colorado. And today we have Dustin Fife, who's here to talk about it in greater detail. Take it away, Dustin. Well, and I would like to just begin by saying thank you for having me. And also, one thing you're not going to see in this presentation, for the most part, is we're not trying to convince you today that OER is a good thing, that open is something to be strived for. We are all taking that for granted, for the most part, as we, we talk about these initiatives. If you still need to be convinced about the merits of open, please reach out to one of us. I'm sure many of us will be happy to have those conversations. We're, we're taking you know, 10 steps past that to talk about the scalability and the big initiatives that come with open. Um, so, you know, the value, we're not, the value statements and things that usually come with this, we are all mostly taking that for granted, myself especially. Um, the other thing I always like to do when I start to speak to people is give them the big takeaway um, because then you might be able to take that phone call or whatever it is that's happening in our lives as we all do everything from our offices these days. Um, and for me, as you move towards scalability, the best way to assure your ability to do that is to make sure that OER and open access practices exist in formal ways in some sort of policy somewhere in the world within which you're working so that you can point to those things. And so on here, I have that there's lots of different approaches to open. There's individual, programmatic, institutional, regional, statewide, national, international, all of those things. They all exist. For you to start to scale programs in your region, at your institution, at your state, it's easier to discuss this with people if you know the places that it already exists in your state. So when I move around the state of Colorado and I start to work with faculty that don't have any reason to trust me because they don't know who I am and I look untrustable, um, I, I like to take those faculty and show them the official policies that the faculties at CU Boulder have built that mention open education. So as these things start to exist, it goes beyond just you trying to convince people that scaling them is a good idea. So if you could go to my next slide and I'm gonna drop something in the chat for you all to look at. In Colorado, the definitions for open and low cost and open educational resources exist in what I would consider one of the most powerful ways. They exist in statewide legislation. And when you're able to show your provost, to show your consortial partners, whomever you're speaking with, even other legislators that, look, we have the Colorado House bill from five years ago that Tanya helped conceive, and we have the new Senate bill that re-upped all of that work, and we have definitions for low cost, and we have definitions for what OER is, and they don't just exist, they exist in law, they exist in statute. It gives you a power to scale the efforts in a way even institutionally or individually that you don't have otherwise. Overall, these bills exist and they're there for you. And if you are at the point in your OER work that you're looking to scale in a similar way, go, go look at these, steal the language, like start working with your own legislators. Um, it, it's there for you. That's one of the great things about anything to do with open is we try to help people not have to rebuild wheels and start from scratch. But there's incredible statutes that exist in places like California, um, Georgia, Colorado, and Texas, as you're going to hear in Oregon. And you don't have to start from scratch on any sort of initiative when it comes to open, even large initiatives. So what we've done in Colorado is create a system in which we prove to legislators that open access stays, saves students money directly, 
And this is one of the ways that they continue to choose to invest in um, education is by creating grant funds that we are able to, as an OER council through CDHE, distribute across the state. We have an ethic where we try to get as many um, institutions of higher education involved as possible, and we work with as many groups as possible. It has scaled up OER over the last six and seven years, and I'm sure Tanya can discuss at some point what it looked like when, when it was started um, in a way that there's not a single IHE in Colorado that doesn't have some sort of initiative working on this work. It worked. And that's technical schools, that's uh, community colleges, two-year schools, four-year schools, graduate programs. Um, you can find people across the state of Colorado working on this. To me, you know, there isn't really one single way, but this is one of the best ways to get kind of that official recognition. But we were lucky. We had a state rep a federal representative who was talking about OER at the national level. We had a governor who could be convinced of almost anything as long as it saves students money. We are in an environment where, you know, as many conversations as it took, it really only took a few linchpins within our state legislator to kind of get this ball rolling. The same thing happened again this year as we 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 got the legislation renewed. Um, truthfully, CDHE wasn't really 100% sure that they could ask for similar funds again because it, they couldn't just put it in their budget because of all of the machinations of, you know, the budget and the governor's office and how things were looking. But we were able to go directly to our legislators and have them create a bill in their own name. And, you know, something I always say to people and my time's running out here really quickly. If you haven't had an experience yet where you get to see how accessible state legislators and state representatives and state senators really can be, I encourage you to reach out to a few within your own communities and see how it works. This type of scale is changing education in Colorado. And to me, it's, it's one of the things that I would encourage other people, if they feel like they have the opportunity, if you feel like you have those few voices on your joint budget committee that can make the change, that this, this is one of the fastest ways to scale up that I, I've seen in the country so far. And we're going to see some other incredible examples that, and some of them have nothing to do with legislation. And that's why this is an, an incredible session. And I will just pass that time on and remind everyone that my takeaway is make open exist in policy somewhere, anywhere, and then start scaling up from there. Because that, that gives you strength to point to different institutions and different bodies doing this work. Excellent, thank you so much, Dustin. I appreciate that so much. Um, you've given great examples. And if you look in the chat, you can see other places where Colorado has codified the OER work that they've done through their master plan um, and through legislation. And also you had a picture of, um, I think they, the governor even declared an OER day and all kinds of wonderful top level policies and actions that really brought attention to the initiative. And Tanya, the governor gives out OER awards directly to faculty now. So like it's, it's so great. <laughs> it's got some good little fingers <laughs> into the world. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dustin. And next we're going to travel way down south to somewhere much warmer to Texas and invite Judith and let's see Kyla to present next. Tanya, thank you so much. Before Dr. Tori discusses the work of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, I just wanted to share on behalf of Dr. Tory and my organization, Digitex, that we recognize and honor the original stewards of the land and region now known as Texas. We honor the federally recognized tribes, including the Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas, the Kickapoo traditional tribe of Texas, and the Isleta del Sur Pueblo. We acknowledge the state recognized tribes, including the Lapan Apache tribe and the Texas band of Yaqui Indians. We honor the Coahuitican, Mescalero Apaches, Tankawa, Karankawa, Eastern Pueblo, Caddo, Carrizo Comicrudo, and Comanche or Numana in their language. 
We acknowledge these nations as the first peoples of this land that continue to carry their stories. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Tori now. Thank you, Judith. Um, and thank you, Dustin. That was really inspiring. And it's so nice to get some ideas about where to go <laughs> next um, from other places. So I am Kyla Tori. I am uh, the program director in digital learning at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Um, which is the state agency sort of tasked with coordinating work at the universities and community colleges in Texas. Um, our work with OER began way back, well, quite a few years ago, but really got going in 2017. And maybe we can go to the next slide um, with Senate Bill 810 in Texas. Um, there has been a lot of engagement in community in Texas, faculty, librarians, staff, students all over who made it possible for Senate Bill 810 to be passed by the legislature, uh, instituting an OER grant program and calling for a feasibility study for a repository of, of OER resources. Um, we then in 2019 received funding to start that OER repository. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and so we really, sort of got the ball rolling then. But as you'll see in a minute, our OER work has really expanded um, uh, and extended to lots of different areas in the most in our the past couple of years, really. So if we fast forward to 2020, we'll talk about the division of digital learning. Um, next slide, please. So at the coordinating board, we established a division of digital learning in November of 2020. So we're just about a year old now. Um, and the mission of the division of digital learning is to provide leadership and advocacy for digital learning in higher education and promote, sustain, and advance a quality digital learner experience, positioning Texas as a world leader and resulting in globally competitive, digitally proficient citizens. OER is a huge part of what we do in the division of digital learning. Um, we are trying to uh, sort of engage all of the other all of the other divisions in the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board in this work and and uh, expanding OER statewide. So you'll see there's our team. We're we call ourselves small but mighty. There's just a few of us so far, but <laughs> we are expanding. Um, and then down at the bottom, you'll see our core values. Uh, the mission, which is on the next slide, is to uh, raise awareness, build capacity, and recognize digital excellence. Um, and this, in, we do this in many ways, specifically for OER, which I will talk about in just a moment. So we were fortunate to receive some uh, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds from the Federal CARES Act, which we have used to sort of innovate and expand our OER work. Um, we do this with the strategy, strategies of listening and engaging stakeholders and then serving and supporting our community in Texas. Um, when I say listening and engaging state, listening to and engaging stakeholders, um, we do this in a variety of ways. One is through our learning technology advisory committee, which has a task force on open educational resources. Um, we do lots of research, and I think this has been a big part of our success in Texas, um, we do an OER landscape survey, which is in its second iteration, which Judith will talk about. Um, we're engaged right now with the University of Texas at Austin School of Design and Creative Technologies to do a, a broad research engagement about digital learning in te Texas and OER. Um, and on the horizon, we have a gap analysis research study that's coming for workforce courses and also our core sort of introductory courses to see where where the resources exist and where we can build and expand. Um, not quite yet. Uh, so we also have grants. So we have the state grants that were um, that were started by the legislature in 2017, and those are for course redesign. They go directly to faculty members to redesign their courses. And then with the GEAR funds, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, we have instituted additional um, additional course redesign grants that um, are also, and we're also working with some technology assistance partners for that. So OpenStax at Rice University 
the Dana Center at, at UT Austin and Dallas College are helping, are working directly with our grantees to help, um, help them develop and design the resources that they will then put into our statewide repository, which I'll talk about in a minute. As far as supporting our community, we have a lot of events um, and professional development. So there are some large scale community events like the Open Texas Conference, which Judith will talk more about. Um, in February we, upcoming, we have a Creator Fest, which we're calling the OER Text Creator Fest, um, which is in partnership with OpenStax. And that will be kind of a hackathon type event where uh, faculty and staff can come in and work directly on OER projects that they have in progress. We also have professional learning sessions now for um, any for people at a variety of levels to introduce them to OER. We have a, an OER Core Elements Academy that's had a couple of cohorts now. And then we'll have Advanced Skills and Creators Academy, Creator Academies coming up in the spring of 2022, as well as um, a resource for the resource retreat, which is a sort of train the trainer session so that we can expand some of the, um, some of the professional learning directly to the institutions. And we have our OER text repository. So we built um, with, of the Institute for the Study of Knowledge and Management and Education, or ISCME, we built a sort of library of OER materials that was initially focused on uh, core sort of introductory large scale classes, but has grown significantly since then. Um, it turned one this fall, so just in September we turned one, and so far we have over 100,000 users across all continents. Um, we've had over 8,000 added resources and over 1,500 authored resources via the, the authoring tool within the site. Um, we're very happy and proud about that, and we're working on um, even expanding that uh, beyond just academic resources into things like campus action plans and, um, and other tools for the universities and community colleges to use. Um, at, but none of this work would be possible without our partners, and they're all on the next slide, which uh, we work with a lot of different uh, institutions and organizations to, uh, to sort of scale and expand the work that we're doing and also to, you know, work with their expertise. Um, Digitex, is, Judith will speak next, is one of our, our best partners. And um, we also work with the Texas Digital Library and OpenStax and the Dana Center and Dallas College and ISKME uh, and various projects, and they are essential to our success. So I think uh, if you're gonna leave with a message about the work in Texas, it is just to be innovative and also partner with those who are out there who are doing this work already. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Judith. Thank you, Tanya. So I want to talk today about creating a culture of open across Texas. And I am Judith Sebestin. I serve as the executive director of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas. We support a variety of initiatives across Texas and beyond, including interinstitutional core sharing at Texas public community colleges, the Texas Quality Matters Consortium, engaging in digital research broadly conceived, and of course, supporting open education policy and practice. Next slide, please. Creating a culture of open across Texas is very similar um, to what Kyla talked about. It's, it's really built on a foundation of collaborations and we couldn't do what we do without the incredible community of partners in which we, in, with which, whom we work. Now this includes, of course, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Kyla, thank you for your nods to us. Um, the Texas Digital Library, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. We're also a part of the Doers 3 Collaborative, and we are a proud member of the fairly recent initiative, inclusiveaccess.org, along with Spark and a variety of other organizations. So collaborations are at the heart of what we do in our work, and open education makes this easy because it truly is a community of practitioners. And one of our, I think, most impactful collaborations has been in the area of research and data. Along with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and ISCME, we conduct a biannual 
biennial landscape analysis or a survey and landscape analysis on open education policy and practice across Texas. We survey uh, two four-year public and private nonprofit and health-related institutions in Texas. You can see there, that was our first report there on the left um, in 2019, the cover of that report. And I believe that Kim is putting in a link, she has put in a link actually, thank you Kim, to our um, open education website, which has links to all everything I'm going to talk about here today. So you can get a link to the 2019 report. We are very soon to, I think just about any day now to release our 2021 report based on that survey. But just to give you a little preview of, of that, 110 institutions in Texas participated. And, and the results of that survey told us that nearly 70% of the state's institutions are advancing the use of OER for online and emergency remote learning. Those leading the way take a systems approach to OER policy and practice we have found. So they work collaboratively across various campus offices and often with other institutions. And then at the end of the report, we have, we're publishing some implications and recommendations, including things like the development of a state OER playbook, the creation of new OER professional development grant opportunities, as well as publishing uh, best practices case studies, and the creation of various OER curriculum development supports. So stay tuned, check on our website because that should be coming out very soon. And then as Kyla mentioned, we partner with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and with the Texas, Texas Digital Library to organize and hold Open Texas, which is a statewide annual statewide conference. We held the first online March 11th through 12th in 2021, and we had over 1,100 registrants for that conference. It was a very exciting event, and, and really our attendees were not just from in Texas, but also outside of Texas as well. The next conference is again going to be held virtually and it's scheduled for September 21st to 22nd in 2022. Next slide. So just a few other um, initiatives and resources that we engage in or have um, is our, our very proud to offer Texas Learn OER, which is a set of openly licensed 10 module, uh, a set of 10 modules that are openly licensed for professional development for open education staff, administrators, faculty. We recently released a new iteration of this that has more content on equity, as well as updated content on Texas, among other inf information that we've augmented. And I'm also proud to announce that we were a winner of an Open Education Excellence Award recently. In the, or Texas Learn OER was in the category of open reuse, remix, and adaptation. And then finally, we also publish case studies and we have published one on open educational resource best practices. We hope to continue to do these in partnership with the coordinating board and potentially other collaborators. And finally, we are wanting to allocate resources to provide to augmenting grant funding that is available through this Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board across the state. We actually, in all honesty, uh, created a grant program this past year to support the development of OER in career and technical education. We did not receive any applications for this funding. So what we're now, our next step is um, engaging in a collaboration with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and ISCME once again, very good partners of ours, to do a needs analysis and assess what the needs are in Texas for the area, for, for a variety, variety of fields of OER, and then to engage in more intentional development of OER to support, to fill those holes and support those needs. And we hope to be able to then jumpstart or we kickstart a grant program using our funds. So just, I'm so proud to announce that Texas is open, as I think Kyla also demonstrated, and we'll look forward to any questions that there might be after my wonderful esteemed colleague in Oregon, Amy Hofer, talks about what they're doing there. Thanks, Judith, and thanks for having me. I'm Amy Hofer. I'm the Statewide Open Education Program Director and Open Oregon Educational Resources promotes textbook affordability for community college and university students and facilitates widespread adoption of open, low cost, high quality materials. You can visit openoregon.org for a lot more information showcasing what's happening across the state. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about three strategies for large scale collaboration. Um, and this is adapted from other talks that I've given that are um, kind of like what to do at different funding levels. So I'm going to talk about having a community of practice, doing OER impact research and OER policy that um, you can do actually without, I mean, I suppose you could engage in those activities without having any funding available. So hopefully this is going to be useful takeaways for everybody. And let's go on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to acknowledge the land where I am right now. Um, I'm at my house in Northeast Portland, Oregon. And in this area, there are numerous indigenous tribes, people, and villages whose history I will acknowledge using information from um, Native Land Digital. And that link is in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. Um, so my neighborhood is closely associated with the territories of the Clackamas Cascades and Cowlitz tribes, as well as the Confederated tribes of Grand Ronde. Um, and my neighborhood has also been affected by um, systemic racism including redlining and gentrification. So there's a lot of injustice that has led to my being here now. Um, so I wanna recognize that and also thank Portland's Native American Youth and Family Center and the Vanport Mosaic for helping me learn more about this and helping me with information um, that let me write this statement. So let's go to the next slide and I'm gonna talk about um, building a community of practice. So I'm in a statewide position, right? And Oregon has 17 community colleges and seven universities that are not in a system. So um, I, right away when I started in 2015, I needed to make sure that I had a point person at every institution in Oregon. And that's been an ongoing way to keep communication open and start to build a community of practice in the state. Um, so, you know, I just want to start out by saying that um, it's been a really effective model to have one person, me, be accountable for effectively spending our money. Um, and on the other hand, a statewide OER program just cannot be one person's job, right? There needs to be a deeper bench of expertise and support for OER in a whole state. Um, so it's really a both and. Um, and if you're at a single institution, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders involved in OER work. There's librarians, distance learning, accessibility services, student leadership, the bookstore, the registrar, the business office, there's institutional research. There's a lot of stakeholders that um, we might not necessarily immediately think of that can all get pulled into an OER initiative. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to convene um, at the statewide level. There's professional development opportunities. We do champion awards that are really super fun. Um, at the institutional level, you might be organizing a committee or a work group. There are informal ways to gather around a shared interest in open education, but really finding your people is sort of the first step for anybody, I think. So let's go to the next slide and I'm gonna talk a little bit about OER impact research. So. The statewide OER program in Oregon does a lot of data collection and reporting to show our impact. Um, and one reason to do that is to see if we're actually doing what we set out to do in our mission. And we also wanna use that data to advocate for ongoing funding and increasing funding, right? So a key audience for that is legislators. Um, and the metric that that group of people cares about the most is student savings. So that's where I put a lot of my research effort. And as educators, we know that that's not the end of the story, right? It's um, in some ways the beginning of the story. Um, saving money is really important to students and I'm not in any way minimizing that, but of course you can also look at equity impacts, student outcome impacts, right? Like student success, um, all those other sort of metrics that um, are also important. Um, and I'm able to do this outward facing reporting through the Open Oregon website. Um, I provide institutional reports back to each college and university so that they can share the, their data back locally. Um, and a few examples of research projects that I do. So um, I look at the cost of course materials for transfer degrees at each college. Um, I've looked at the savings impact of grant programs since 2015. And I've also looked at the savings represented by our no cost and low cost schedule designation. And these are some examples of the really big impact research projects that you sort of need to um, be in a statewide 
position to have that communication um, and really be working with each institution to get the data that you need to do that. Um, but you know, if you're at an institutional setting, if you're just getting started, um, maybe you wanna look at baseline data that has to do with costs so that you have some place to start your measurement over time. You could do a student survey, you could look at textbook adoption data from the bookstore. Um, and I, I really do recommend knowing your audience, as I mentioned, because any kind of research is so time consuming. You really wanna be sure that you're pinpointing um, and using, a, you know, effectively using that research time to gather something that you'll be able to use for, you know, the purpose that you've defined, in my case, advocacy. So let's go to the next slide, um, which is um, my second to last slide here. So I want to talk a little bit about policy um, in Oregon. In 2015, we passed House Bill 2871, and this was the bill that um, required that each college and university have um, a no cost and low cost schedule designation. Um, and this has been amazing for students as um, a proof of concept. You know, we've seen that this can be a really important way to communicate with students um, about the availability of these courses. Um, in 2013, we passed, um, sorry, in 2019, I've got too many numbers going, we passed House Bill 2213, and this required each institution to have a textbook affordability plan. Um, and the plans have to include certain things like an academic freedom statement, measurable goals. It also has to include a way to market the no cost and low cost designation to students because a study showed that a lot of students weren't aware of the designation or they didn't know how to find it or use it. So there was sort of like a follow on piece there. Um, most recently in 2021, we passed House Bill 2919. And this requires that um, institutions have 75% of courses report what course materials they're gonna use in time for the information to be in the schedule when registration opens. So this is a lot earlier than some faculty are used to reporting, but it allows us to actually have the data and communicate effectively with students when the information is gonna be most relevant. Um, not to say that everybody runs right out and buys their textbook immediately when they register, but it's just so important for students to have time to budget. So that's that transparency is really what that bill is aiming at. And then I just have one more slide if we go to the next. Um, and this is my snail frozen in place, like not quite reaching the finish line here. Um, and this is just to normalize um, how slowly things can sometimes move. Um, my really big challenge right now is managing growth. It's a really good challenge to have, but I've got three new team members. I've got new external grant funded projects that are spinning up. Um, and we're advocating for sustainable funding um, in order to maintain the model that we're developing with one-time funding. Um, and I have to say the biggest lesson that keeps coming up again and again in this um, current phase of growth is just pause, slow down. Um, the work that we're doing is really important, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like urgent and has to be done really fast. It's really worth it to um, take the time to you know, listen to people and develop relationships, test different ideas, um, you know, that that is giving weight to the importance of the work that we're doing. So that's what I have. And um, thank you so much again. And I think we'll go back to Tanya. So thank you so much to all of our panelists today. I'm sure the attendees who were here are just full of excellent ideas uh, and I maybe questions that they have about the work that you've done. Just to summarize, a few of the things I heard you say were that policy and legislation is very important um, in all levels of your advocacy, that you've worked on grants, that you've created communities of practice, that communication is very important, that you've collected data and you've reported it, that there's a lot going on in terms of advocacy, um, some of you have done surveys, um, and you also do a lot of collaboration with outside OER organizations. You've mentioned them throughout your presentations, and you really see this wonderful ecosystem of people inside of um, states and systems and institutions working with organizations that specialize in open and OER 
um, and that natural collaboration among all of these groups. You've also talked about technology and repositories. And so there's so much to explore, I'm sure, for the guests who are here on the presentation today. If you could give one really good piece of advice um, to people who are just starting and would like to be involved, what would you say to someone who's here today and is just beginning? So I'll start with, let's see who looks like they have an answer. <laughs> Dustin, you wanna say your one piece of really good advice for the new people? No matter what stage you're at, whether you're talking about starting something institutionally, regionally, statewide, national, there is zero reason to start from scratch. There are a community of people to build this off of and to connect you to. So don't, don't feel like you need to do anything in this space on your own. It goes against the ethos of everything we're doing. There are people here for you, people who want to lift you up. So, so let them. Did he steal all of your answers? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up and say, I, I, that is so well said, Dustin. And I, you know, I, I have a phrase I like to use, and that is that sharing is caring. The, at the heart of open education is sharing. It's the idea that knowledge should be open and shared. And what you'll find at whatever stage you're at is a community of practitioners, policymakers, stakeholders who are advocates for that ethos and, and who are more than willing to share their experiences and knowledge with you. It, it's, it's simply, it's just an amazing community in that capacity. I'm just going to plus one that as well. I mean, when I started in 2015, I started cold calling other people in open ed and um, like Quill West in Washington State was one of the people that helped me so much. And I'm still paying that forward. I also really um, recommend there was a project that Ursula Pike did recently called OER origin stories about um, people getting started in OER. Um, I think in particular women of color getting started and um, it, I think that that might be another really nice way in and a starting place to sort of understand all these different pathways into the field. Yes, I'll put the and, link and into that. She did that in the open uh, in the Spark Open Education Leadership Program, and she was I was her mentor. So thank you for mentioning that, Amy. And I have to, and I have to say thank you too because Ursula serves as Digitex's associate director. So. Um, yeah. This is going to be released very soon, the published version of it. And it's it is it's an amazing resource that highlights the work of some just uh, you know really wonderfully co collaborative, diverse luminaries, I, I is what I would say in the field. So Tanya, can I add one more? Oh uh, yeah, but let's have let's have Kyla give hers first. Oh sorry, Kyla. <laughs> You're fine. Um, I mean, I'm just gonna echo what everybody else said, but also just say that it's easy to bring new people into the community too, because it is such a uh, just wonderful idea. You know, it's, it's an inspiring idea to, to share and to uh, save money for students. And to, uh, so it's great. It's easy to bring others in if you just talk to them about it. I agree, Kyla. Everyone gets to win with OER. Everyone feels like they're, there's something um, successful for them. And Dustin, what else were you going to add? Well, just was what Kyla said there too. Like you can frame it, like if you're getting into these political frames, you can frame it for conservatives, you can frame it for liberals, like you can frame it in a lot of different ways. Tanya's right, everyone wins. I like to give new folks like a, a little caveat, like a lot of people get into this space and like they, they think OER and the open movement is gonna is going to absolutely fix everything that's wrong with higher education. And while everyone here might sneer at me, I just want to say it's not. It's not going to do that. But if you start to pair it with the other incredible movements that that can move towards systemic change and don't just stay in a sphere where this is the one important thing that will change open education, I mean that will change education. You will, you will move this initiative forward and you will move a lot of other things forward too because this can work with so many other things if you're open to it. And I just, you know, I, I don't like to throw water on anyone's fire. I just like, we all know that 
the person who thinks that this is the only important thing happening in higher ed, and it, it's just not. Well, I think there's also such a wonderful community around open that when you bring in all these stakeholders and people with um, ideas and solutions that you can expand it beyond just licensing or whatever. And so we're very excited to see all of the next places that states and systems and institutions and all of these advocacy groups will take open education. We've seen a huge push for um, deeper communication and connection for teaching and learning. And there's so many new applications forming every day. Um, the field is expanding and we're excited to be part of it. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan to wrap it up. And if anyone has any questions or would like to contact us, our contact information is on this final slide. Please do get involved. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Look for the hashtag OER on Twitter. There's always something exciting happening out there. And we're very excited to welcome people into the community and share everything we know and um, welcome you. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Tanya. We really appreciate the work that you're doing on behalf of all the states. And thank you for pulling together this wonderful panel. So you can come back and access the slides probably later this afternoon, and then we'll have the recording up as soon as possible. But make sure to share any questions that come up, and you can also post additional resources as you come around. Uh, we will have this open till December 31st, so let's keep the conversation going. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.